Now, most of you know David, well, a lot of you know David. Um, David is uh, the project manager or the project leader for our software, um, what do you call it, uh, software conservation for the CCS. Um, had a long career at Leeds University, uh, looking at all sorts of things from what I can understand, including running the um, the system for, for, for quite a while. But since he's retired, um, I tend to think of David as rooting around bins, looking for old line printer listings to try to recreate okay. the software of the machines that uh, that ran them. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what, what else I can say, David. This seems to be most of my recollection of you is you talking about old old bits and pieces of software you resurrected. Tonight, he's going to talk about resurrecting software for for one of the later Leo machines, which he's calling Leo two and three quarters or Leo two and a half. But um, I'm sure a lot of you know much, much more about Leo than I do. So um, I'll just hand over to David, really. David, you have you have control if you want to start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Well, I've clicked the button. Right, it's looking good. Yeah, well, I'll get my screen to look right. Yes, success. <clears throat> um, except I seem to have lost the title slide. There we go. <coughs> well, good evening, <laughs> blank faces. <laughs> because all at present, all I've got is a list of names. Um, I'm... I find it easy, I have to admit, to remember the things that I did when I was um, in my 20s and 30s than I can remember the things that I did um, when I was in my 60s and 70s. Um, and even now, it's worse again. Let me... So, this all started with a request from John Danes um, who was aware that I had <coughs> successfully um, sort of organised a group of people to get KDF9 Western Algol to work. And it uh, snowballed from there. So John came along with a big box of printout uh, and some original manuals and sundry diagrams and a box of mysterious paper tapes turned up, though this wasn't John's doing. Um, the CCS was bequeathed a box of mysterious paper tapes. But I had had the previous success with KDF9 Western Algol, and John asked if I could do the same for Leo. And, and here's the printout that he showed us. As you can see, it's top quality stuff. No. So, Unlike the KDF9 software that we worked on, it does at least have lots of comments. Um, and <clears throat> it does get a bit better quality as you move further into the pile of paper. But as regards previous Leo 3 experience, I had none at all. I appreciated the chance that I am going to understand how somebody would deal with software relics that related to a system that they'd never met. So in fact, I was rather glad uh, to have this chance. Now, there we got the original manuals and you see the source text printer. That's all we had. Everything we had was on paper. Um, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt. Can you stop me getting the admit messages? Thank you. Um, so the manuals were, were scanned because we we needed early access to good online manuals because my initial ignorance meant that I needed to be able to understand the machine, but not to learn all of it because I was too old to remember the contents of all those manuals. 
I had to be able to refer to the right bit quickly when a question arose. Now, the ambition is to preserve the historic software so that it could be studied um, both at source code level and the documentation, and of course, see how it works by running it with emulation and to browse through the source text and seeing how it was written, you could appreciate the techniques of the era. Now we very much used HTML as a way of um, dealing with both the documentation and the source text because it allows us to put hyperlinks in to connect relevant information and also, uh, you can deal with non-ISO characters because the Leo 3 does have a few quirks in his character set. And of course, you want a presentation that has some sort of 21st century flavor, or at least the 1990s. So let's look at Leo 3. It's a, in some ways a typical machine of the 1960s. Uh, you have a resident master routine in the bottom end of store. Uh, and then you run uh, application programs or apps as we would call them nowadays. Um, and they make calls on the master routine from time to time. The master routine was configured for each individual machine. Now, and there was about uh, 200 kilobytes of memory and each bit was a ferrite core with four wires threaded through it. So, memory was very precious and rather expensive. Now, it's a real memory machine. There's no address translation, like the IBM 360. I don't know if you remember um, the 360 and storage protection keys and IBM TXT files, um, but it does pose problems for multiprogramming when you have multiple programs existing in the same address space. So the surviving source code that we got with a master routine, which Leo people call 09001, and the configuration program for that master routine called 08004, and the intercode translator called 08001. Now, there were also sundry utility programs, and everything was written in intercode, including the intercode translator. What there wasn't was the Clio compiler, which it would appear was listed out by Colin Tully, who was the person who collected all this stuff, but it ended up being recycled. Um, but with some fortune, we may someday turn up a listing of the Clio compiler, because it does appear to have been a very significant part of Leo 3. All these three pieces of software are, of course, interdependent. The intercode translator needs a master routine to run on, and it needs itself to generate the binary program. The configuration program also needs a master routine, and it needs the translator in order to um, uh, translate itself. It also needs the source code of the master routine, and we did discover that the one we had was actually aiming for a later version of the master routine, but we seem to have managed to work our way around that. And the master routine itself needs the other two just for generating a binary program. So where did we get to? Well, we dealt with the original manuals uh, very early in the project. And when I found the cursor, I should be able to show you. There we are. The original manuals are online. And is that big enough? We can be a bit bigger. And so here, here is the online manual. And here is the scan. Well, there will be in a minute. Now, although they look superficially similar, 
the big thing about the online version is that all these are hot links so that you can find your way to a particular answer much more quickly than just by trying to read it all. Um, and this documentation is a vital component of our reload because of working with an unfamiliar machine. Um, now, we then, let's go back. The, <laughs> The genuine intercode translator, we also have online. Now, this is the output from our system that was part of the transition process. You can see this is the language. In each line of intercode has a serial number. And then here's the actual intercode itself. And there's the comments, but it is not a very uh, easy to read language. And these numbers here are cross references to other statements. And, and when you click them, they are in fact hot links. So the <clears throat> The situation is that we've got a good online documentation and we can process the source text. <clears throat> so how did you run a program on the Leo 3? Well, firstly, before you could run any programs, you had to load the master routine and that mount the tape with the binary program and then once you've done that you could load the paper tape control data and then you had to stack the allocate command we'll explain what stacking a command is in just a moment so here's the real leo3 operators console and over on the back there you can see can you see the cursor there's the operator's typewriter and the, the operator uh, controls the machine by setting these switches. Um, I was absolutely amazed to discover there is no operator's keyboard. Um, that's it. So our Leo 3 has a key, an operator's console like that. I hope you can see the similarity. Um, and also, we need a little more than a console for operators because they also do other jobs like loading my tapes and putting paper tapes in readers and things like that. And so the other bit of our console emulates that sort of activity. So how do we run a program? Well, load the master routine and away we go. So here's crossing a few fingers and there's the printer and there's the operator typewriter and there's the console. Now I slightly cheated here if you take the zip file from the website, what you will get is something where you can click go.bat and off it goes. But this com this presentation has had to be quickly cobbled to work on, um, the, uh, pardon me, quickly cobbled to work on the Linux machine. And so it just seems to uh, I'm just trying to get onto the, there we go. And there, now the 
typewriters won't go up. We can load the first my tape. And there's a button here called Go, which lets the machine run a few thousand instructions. There's a machine, there's a button here called Turbo up at the top, which lets the machine just run free. But it's so much faster than the real one that you can't follow what's going on, especially as the emulation of magnetic tapes is instant. And so you, it turns out that using the Go button, you can actually watch the machine much more effectively. Now, you have to, when you set, we set a number on there, and when you stack it, you press that, it goes to the, um, it goes to the register on the machine, which is interrogated from time to time, and that's uh, how the operator communicates. Now, we've told it that we want actually to run the master routine, and it wants to know what date it is. In the absence of a keyboard, you put the date in like this. That's the 23rd of the 1st. And off we go. Um, we were quite amazed the first time we finally got this message out because it doesn't look as though it's a very professional way to introduce your operating system. And we have a sneaking suspicion that the version we have is really um, a late development version rather than what was finally released. So we now it helps a lot if you tell it something about the, uh, the printer. And it says we want the special printer. And it's also necessary to tell it that you want the paper tape reader because our machine doesn't have a card reader. And so now we've got, we've, we've got the master routine. And what I'm about to show you is a well-known program in Intercode. Uh, you won't have too much difficulty guessing when you see the name of the magnetic tape that we're loading. So there's the paper tape being loaded. There's the magnetic tape being loaded. Look how much quicker that is than real life. And then you have to tell it the command to run a program. And you press stack. And then let it obey a few more instructions. And lo and behold, there's the um, output from this program. And you can easily put the uh, paper tape in again and run it again. Um, you'll notice that the version on the typewriter says hello world E and this says two exclamation marks. Well, there isn't an exclamation mark in the Leo character set, but there is a number 11, um, which doesn't exist in ISO. So I use the Unicode double exclamation mark to uh, stand in for the Leo number 11. But that's the simplicity of running a program. Um, so if you use the Windows version, well, the, the version on the website is customized for Windows. And if you just download it and click go in, then you get this screen. Uh, the only difference is that it doesn't have standard ISO typewriter on the Windows console. So the, the bright stuff is what was typed out by the Leo software and the other stuff that's things about loading magnetic tapes and such like. So how did we get there? Well, copy typing, because the printouts are just nowhere near suitable for um, OCR. Maybe modern AI software could read them, but uh, we're going back teens of years now to when this lot started. Also, of course, it was very important to 
understand the uh, system and that's where the documentation comes in. Uh, so obviously we're going to need a machine code emulator and we're not and we're going to need some kind of interim translator to take the intercode and get some kind of a binary program uh, so that we can actually translate the intercode translator itself. And we also produce various software tools uh, to generate more modern listings amongst other things and to put in the hyperlinks in the documentation. We did in the event get the graphical user interface, which of course we've just recently seen, but that actually came much later. The source code then of the Intercode Translator 0800, well, these were listings from the translator. You see, it was a numeric language. How on earth do you actually make some sense of it? Well, in the event, we copy typed it onto spreadsheets. Um, so here's the actual printout, and we loaded it into a spreadsheet. You can see, obviously, you can't see the actual digits, but it was very useful because those serial numbers all go up in order. So you can make the spreadsheet calculate those. And the, we then saved the CSV files and the interim translator uh, translated them. Now, there is, you, here's the intercode. Now, in fact, not all of this information is essential, like that bit there. We need the serial number, and then there's the action and the other bits of the instruction. And the comments over here, um, we, <clears throat> we had a duplicate system of, of copy typing, you, and people would book to um, type their uh, copies. So, you would start with a page that looked like that. And then you would end up producing a CSV file um, that looked like that. So, sorry, that's. And so that, now, it was much easier to type a spreadsheet than to type something like that. So. So now, we want the binary program. We've got the machine readable source listing and we've got we write an interim translator in C, which converts this to a binary program to load into a bare machine because um, we don't have a master routine yet. And we run this program to produce then a genuine binary. In the meantime, we work on the documentation to make it online. Volume one, the computer facilities, to Clio, and it was a big mistake. I didn't scan that because I wanted to motivate people to find the Clio compiler. That motivation never worked, and so I'm afraid Clio is missing. Well, we got there with copy typing. Understanding the Leo system involved a lot of work on the documentation, and then we had the machine code emulator and the interim integral translator and these things were all developed in parallel um, and if we look at the machine code emulator now then the form of the instruction has um, what is called an action a discriminator uh, a discriminant um, which is only a one bit and a modifier and then um, an address bar. This, in the long mode, where you're dealing with a, a two-word operand, then there are two modes of operation, 
and the bottom bit indicates which mode you're going to use. But we'll stick to what's called the short mode. Um, and the, I, the plan is to the emulator to take the top eight bits, which define really what you want to do, and then to um, do a giant switch on that to do the appropriate things. There is a facility on Leo which is akin to the SMO instruction on the 1900. Um, and that is uh, dealt with uh, <coughs> quite, quite early on in the implementation. As regards the definition of the article, fortunately, the Our Computer Heritage website has the definition of the Leo 3 order code, so, which has been proofread many times by people who know the answers, so it can be relied upon. And here we are um, turning it into a plain text file. And, and then I wrote a little tiny program, um, 97 lines, which produced a skeleton emulator um, for the entire machine code. The only snag with this skeleton is that as soon as you try and obey anything, it says uh, not implemented. Uh, and so, <clears throat> but at least it's got the right structure. And here, for instance, is the transfer instruction, which uh, takes the contents of the accumulator and puts them in memory. And so, Everything down to here was generated automatically. We just have to add that little bit. Um, and in fact, there's also a copy instruction, which is almost the same. So we put the two together, but there's one gotcha there. There it is. A quirk of Leo is that whereas the accumulator is in well, when in binary, it's in two's complement, it's in radix complement, um, but the information in memory is in sign and modulus. So you have to have a special routine to deal with negative numbers. Um, it, <clears throat> it's one of the things that absolutely amazed me when I found it out. So the only other thing we need to do is load the binary program. Of course, we need to decide what format and it's just very simple, one line per instruction, the th three bits, uh, the, the action, the discriminant, the modifier, and then the address part. And then there's, a, you can have one thing to say where to start loading and one thing to say where to enter. And here's a tiny little binary program. Um, and you could, the emulator will just read that and obey it. So our emulators, we can now load a binary program and we can execute store instructions and everything else is reported as not yet implemented. So when we've got, we're working on the interim translator, uh, we can feed the results into the emulator, which will immediately fail, but then it tells us which bits uh, to implement next. And so the, <laughs> Intercode translator, the design is that it will read the CSV files um, that the copy type is produced. And there's an appendix in the manual that tells you what the intercode translator needs to generate. Uh, so it's got this, it's not a quite a complete description, especially when you get to input output, but it's um, <clears throat> a long way along the right road. The <laughs> we also, let me go back one. And we, so it now looking at the binary that it actually generates, which is back to this screen, go on. My laptop's having a slight struggle here. That should scroll down. There we are, it's done it. Uh, and so you can see that 
the actual intercode that we're processing is in this area here. But over on the left is the binary program. Here's the address at which the stuff is loaded. And if we just slide a little bit over to the right, we can see we've added in the what the intercode action actually does. And not only that, it's a hot link to um, the actual di um, <clears throat> the actual documentation. So by working like this, it was possible to make good progress on implementing um, and we only implement uh, those instructions that we have actually met. Uh, we've got five more tabs open here than was intended. Um, so, we are now implementing this in interim integral translator. So, we're slowly learning intercode. And we've modernized the documentation and we produced a cross reference list, which meant that we could very quickly go from the action number to either the documentation that said what it should do or the bit that said what in what machine code you're supposed to generate. And it's by processing the documentation in such a, a, a way that we were able to make far better progress than I think we would have done, given that we started out with zero knowledge about the Leo. So we made a skeleton translator like we did for the emulator, another big case statement and initially everything generates a halt instruction. So this learning on the job um, <clears throat> was much facilitated by the HTML name anchors. And I, we had, I actually wrote a little program to go through the manual pages and put HTML name anchors in. And you've seen the cross-reference list, which was a vital um, asset and the output then we decorated with links to the documentation. Uh, later on we produced a program to post-process the listings from the genuine translator to make them nearly as good as the listings as from the interim translator. So let's have a bit more of a look at intercode. It's a, a pseudo machine code for what I call Leo 3 plus plus. It's got um, no labels, only line serial numbers. Um, it's got no instruction mnemonics, only numbers. And the editing is done by the translator so that if you slot another instruction in, it actually increases subsequent serial numbers. Here's a picture of the way the translator works. We've got an input tape with a program that we are going to modify. It goes into the translator, it uses a work tape to um, help it, and then it produces a new version out on another tape and the edit instructions are fed in on paper tape as seen on the left. Uh, now, what we got is actually this printer output here. Um, now, when you're first producing a program, in fact, you don't have that input tape. And this is, this is the way in which we tend to operate. In, uh, for the most part. So if we um, 
bring back our Bosch printer, bring back our look, got our operator's typewriter and bring back the Leo console. Then we can, um, first of all, we need to uh, unload the mag tape. Done. Um, then we need to get the right paper tape reader, which is the source text. And then we also need to get the right binary program, which is our famous 080 the integral translator and mount that. Then we are about to stack the command. There's <clears throat> there's a thing called the release tapes index. You have to tell it which magnetic tapes it's actually allowed to write on. So when you've done that, you stack 412 and it actually starts running the integral translator. So there it is. Alloc allocate means it starts running. It tells you which um, memory locations it's loaded in and which devices are needed for the different um, mag tapes. So on route, Number two, it wants a tape because route number two is channel A6 and we'll give it a bit more and then A2 goes on 13, mount it and it's actually starting to print out the program, which is the famous Hello World. Um, then it prints out the binary, for reasons best known to it. And it says alarm number six, which is Leo's way of saying that all works very well and there's nothing alarming about it at all we can look back. So this is the sort of printout you get from running an intercode program. Of course, bigger programs um, use lots and lots of printer paper. But we have to tell it that now we've finished with the intercode translator. And so the answer is uh, option one. And that's ended. So that's intercode. Um, in a nutshell. Um, so we'll, that, that's there if we're running out of time. Sorry, if we if we're running out of material, which I don't think we are. So we we'll now look at computer code, the machine code. Leo 3 is a real memory machine. There are no instruction mnemonics there because it doesn't even really have an assembly language. Instead, the intercode actions 100 to 131 generate computer code actions directly. I'm full of admiration for programmers who've got big lumps of software to work on intercode. It seems that Leo 3 never had an assembly language. Um, and the master routine is actually entirely composed of actions 100 to 131. So it is actually written in computer code. It was such a big jump from this to their high level language Clio. It is such a shame we don't have it. Um, so how did we turn our interim translator into a proper version of 08? Or, um, <coughs> Now, our 
we, first of all, once we've actually managed to use our C version to translate uh, our copy typing into a binary program, we've then got to start to try and run it. It turns out that the paper tape that it reads is not quite identical to the um, to the listing. And so we had to make a program to generate the proper paper tape from our source uh, in CSV files. At the other end, the output <clears throat> is a, uh, intended for the master routine to load. So we had to write a program which we called getbin, which would load that into um, a naked uh, Leo 3. This all becomes obsolete once the master routine works. So the next step to, we run our homemade binary with the, using the emulator and it makes a genuine program tape. We use getbin to make a binary for the emulator. And then we can run the real program, admittedly not in the memory locations it would normally occupy, and make a new um, A2 file. And this enabled us to discover what was the real API for IO. Um, so we then have to um, enhance the emulator to do the proper IO. So how do we generate a master tape? Well, all you have to do is translate the generic master routine, 0901, to produce uh, <coughs> one of these mag tapes. And then we have to generate a configured master routine, which deals with the particular um, configuration that you've got. And then we do that with the generator program 0804. And we mentioned before there was a slight version mismatch. And then um, you can write a bootable tape. When you've got a bootable tape, which we'll produce in a minute, you've then got to be able to load it. Um, and so that you've got to read the first block into word not onwards, which is the way the machine works. And then there's a special loader written in computer code. And that's all it is. Just read the first block and jump. Um, and then you enter at word zero. And after that, our, our Leo 3 is running only heritage software, nothing else. So let's try and generate the master routine um, from the, uh, <coughs> pardon me, generate the master routine from the material that we've got here. So we need our printer back. We need our operator typewriter back. And we also need the Leo console back. Um, we've probably still got the magnetic tape there, so we'd better try and unload it. Uh, so we're going to need program 8004, which we previously translated. Um, we need to, to load that on channel zero. We also need the master routine configuration program in the paper tape reader. Um, we now need to tell it to read a release tapes index, after which we tell it to, um, and we haven't mounted that. So we now need to mount something on channel one. And what it, what it needs here is the <clears throat> first translation 
of the master routine source code, which leaves, which, as they did on Blue Peter, is one I prepared earlier. Um, then away we go, and you see the printer is actually starting to tell us things, uh, and we now need a, something on route two, which is this tape down here. And it's, we give it a bit more go, and it's now finished the amendment phase. And yet another overlay, and it needs something on 13, which is the next one down there. Um, and now let's turn it into turbo mode and it's just printing out all of the master routine here it is in all its glory uh, <clears throat> so I'm a bit surprised. I think. I, yeah, I, I know why it stopped because it says it's finished. Can you see? It's, so now the answer here is actually three. And when we stack that, we get yeah. I'm sorry, I've done something wrong. Oh, I need to take mounting. Uh, on route one. I should have put that on there. And my hunch is it's not going to work. Oh yes, look, can you see? It's actually loaded the new master routine um, and it has incidentally written it out on that magnetic jet that we just mounted. Um, so I think it's fair to claim that our Leo 3 has been reloaded. So what were the surprises? Well, I was surprised to discover that Intercode had no labels. Uh, it looks very much like that Wilkes Wheeler and Gill book of 1951. Um, the SAP assembler for the IBM 704 was released by Cher in 1956. Didn't Leo notice? Um, we also had some curious things. We came across um, misuse of instructions. We found subtract instructions for testing equality that were used in a way that was banned by the manual. Um, and the master routine was impenetrably difficult to follow to the extent that I never really tried. Um, but there were some pleasant surprises. The curious property of the magnetic tape is it reads only six bits into each byte. So when you read the first block of tape into word zero, none of the instructions can have um, either of the top two bits set which means only 25% of the order code is available. Even the jump instruction is one that you can't use. I thought it was a great triumph to uh, be able to turn that into something that actually worked. And in fact, a few years back, I wrote it up in uh, Resurrection. 
the mismatch of the versions in the uh, configuration program, I had expected to be catastrophic. When we found it, um, we just thought, you know, disaster. We've got all this work done and it's not going to be able to work. But it turned out that it was only that the trial system didn't quite work. Um, but the copy typist started to tire and we actually got um, a new tranche of volunteers. So, some afterthoughts. Well, software of the 60s can be brought back to life. Hyperlink documentation is a really good way of getting the emulation and such like implemented for an unfamiliar machine. We have put quite a bit of effort into digitizing the documentation. Now, I'm sure it was well, uh, <clears throat> well rewarded. HTML is an excellent medium for showing both the documentation and the listings. Just simple HTML for the most part with a pre tag. So it's just the actual HTML looks a lot like the material uh, that you started with. Now, veterans know things that manuals do not. And the fact that we had volunteers who were veterans of this system did no end of clearing up of little uncertainties which were mystifying the, the novice. And history is not nostalgia. The way that I dealt with KDF9 was nostalgia because I'd used the machine um, in my um, 20s and 30s. The approach to an unfamiliar machine is more like history, where you're trying to make the material um, acceptable, comprehensible to people who didn't know the original. Now, Leo 3 did not turn out to be just like I expected. I think intercode is very inconvenient language. The lack of labels would have me completely uh, gobsmacked, I think is the word. And all this doing by numbers uh, <coughs> was even down to the routine names of numbers, but KDF9 user code would like that as well. But <clears throat> there are no mnemonics for instructions either. Now, on Nelly at 903, that is also the case, but there are only 16 instructions. There are 150 plus in intercode. Um, <clears throat> now, there is one exception to the question of mnemonics. Um, I came across a few occasions where the action was just say go. Um, it was pretty obvious from the code this was going to be a, some kind of a jump instruction. When I looked at the way that the translator worked, only the bottom four bits of the characters were processed to work out the number of the action. And it turns out that when you do that with the letters G O, you get seven six. And that happens to be the unconditional jump. I would love to know, was it a deliberate design or was it a fluke that just happened? Now, <clears throat> it was early multiprogramming. And when you've got multiple programs in core, you do actually have problems with um, multiprogramming because they each need an address space. And I think it's uh, quite <clears throat> interesting that eventually uh, with there were two main solutions like the datum and limit which the 1900 used but which was actually invented on kdf9 whether it was it's, um independently invented elsewhere we don't know um and then why leo 3 has such messy arithmetic with you can do arithmetic direct in, in pound shillings and pence, but why bother? Why not just do the arithmetic in pence and convert it from printout? Um, it's 
sorry, I, I seem to have lost the ability to change slides. So let's not forget the people who did some of the very best bits of the work because all good jazz concerts end with reintroducing the band. Well, all these people helped. Um, they're in alphabetical order. And at the very end is Ray Smith. He was the guy who had been an operator and then became a programmer. And he, without him, I suspect, we'd never have got it to work. Um, we had uh, Windows experts who uh, managed to uh, take C code that worked on um, GCC and make it work on Visual Studio. Dick Leatherdale very kindly printed articles in uh, Resurrection. Dave Jones, John, Tony Jackson and John Andrews, I think were our second tranche of typists. Jeff Cooper, Chuck Knowles, Ken Kemp were in from the outset. It was all John Danes' fault anyway. And I seen Ken in the uh, audience today. So I'll just leave you with the screen of the real stars of the show and hand you back to our chairman, um, Bob. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. And if you, you can unshare your screen again now so we can see you in oh. full. Um, I think what I'm going to do is ask, I've got a, I've got a whole list of questions in front of me. I'll ask a couple, but um, I think what I'll ask is that people can uh, virtually put their hands up if they've got questions um, and I'll come to you. There's a button on the bottom of my screen that says reactions that allows me to put a hand up. Yeah. So uh, we'll go, we'll go that way. I got a, yeah, a couple of questions from me, David. Um, one, when you, when on your console with those switches that you're flicking up and down, clearly you know what each um, combination of switches means. Is that in the real machine? Is that is that hardwired into something, or is the um, the, the master program reading those switches on a loop? Well, the master program is reading those switches. Um, I'm trying to unshare my screen without success. Um, We never practiced this bit before. <laughs> no, never practiced the end. Yes, that's right. Well, I'm, practice the beginning, but not the end. It'll be it'll be somewhere on the on the green thing at the bottom of your screen somewhere. Well, I can't get the green thing to appear. Oh, okay. I, I'm trying to try try the top. Yeah, yeah I've, I've done it oh, for I'm you. Not, I've got there. Okay. Oh, I did it for you anyway. So I've I just clicked it. on. All yeah. right. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the other things I, I think you, you said before that you didn't have a character for, for 11, so you put uh, a thing with double exclamation marks. And I noticed flying past at one point you had something which I think you were using as a 10, which looked like a, uh, a Russian character or so. It made me wonder how do you cope with uh, presumably this machine did not use ASCII when it was built, it must have used some well, uh, in, interim you know, character code. Predates ASCII uh, by a oh, decade, I would think. Mm -hmm. Um, so, whenever, the same was true with KDF9, whenever you're dealing with a, a machine of that sort of era, um, it's going to have its own quirky character codes, uh, and certainly in the KDF, case of KDF9, the character codes on the printer and the paper tape reader had slight differences. Uh, so, um, you just have to have a a translation table, um, but also uh, with Leo 3, it only has capital letters. Mm. So we dealt with the characters that don't exist by just using lowercase letters. So the go-to character is a G, the 11 is an E, the 10 mm. is a T, ah, right. and the pound sign is a P. So <laughs> that, little e, that little E you had at one point where you had the double exclamation mark on left hand side of the screen and the little E, uh, that E for 11, that, uh, sneaky. Okay. I, I, I it was it was designed for commercial work and the 10 and the 11 were for 10 pence and 11 pence. 
Yeah, and they had a ha the halfpennies and farthings as well on the uh, on the printer at that time, John. Uh, I think. I mean, that would have been the days when we'd have had farthings yeah. and halfpennies, wouldn't we? I think there's a half character. Yeah. There's I a half character, the, yeah. The first time I saw uh, that, that uh, Leo had a character for a 10 and a character, single character for 11, I was a bit stunned for a few seconds. And then, you know, the, the reasonableness of it sank in, really. Just, it's just something we'd not do these days. Yeah. I, I can't see any hands up. I don't know if it's because people haven't put their hands up or because I'm not seeing it. But let's just say if anybody's got questions, just... Um, Unmute yourself and we'll have a bit of a free for all. John, I guess you've got some more questions, have you, for for David? No. <laughs> okay. One well, other thing I noticed, David, your, your your tape. Well, John Belling there has got his hand, his real hand up. I was just thinking about the somewhat medieval intercode um, uh, mnemonics. Uh, how much was? Um, inherited from Leo 2 and Leo 1 before us? Well, just as I began by saying that I didn't know anything about Leo 3 and I came in with enthusiasm because I'd worked on BBC Micros, preser uh, preservation of some of their material and the KDF9 of course and the 1900, all of which were machines I knew. And I'd, I'd wondered how it would be to work on software on a machine you didn't know. So my ignorance was actually um, an asset in that sense. But it does mean that the person to answer your question is John Deans rather than I. I think the the, the original Leo was was came came from lions who who wanted to Im improve the efficiency of, of what they did because they were handling millions of, of small transactions and it was it was the world's first business computer so where the people in manchester were working on um something that was to do with rather more mathematical and scientific work and then became involved with Ferranti and had large government grants. Leo was working with Cambridge, who, who, who were building a machine to provide a service to all departments. And when they, they, they supported that, and once that was working, they got the IPR. And in 1949, and in 1951, they ran the first business job operationally in in the world although i mean there was only leo one leo one until about 1956 whereas there were lots and lots of um Ferranti machines but they they were working on business systems it was an electronic office it was the forerunner of of what we use today but but was it was there for commercial work so when when leo 2 came along which was more advanced four times faster had magnetic tapes and so on that the hardware developed and then when leo 3 came along they they looked around at at what there was multi-programming uh, had become available transistors and so on um so it, it was an evolution from Leo 1 and Leo 2 that, that, that went right back to the early 50s. And decimalization didn't come in till 1971. Does that uh, help? Certainly is. Um, I can see two, two hands up. I can see um, Christine and Tim Lyons. Chris, because Chris, you're at the top, Christine, do uh, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll actually follow up to the statement that's just been made because... I read a book in 1958 which talked about the reason for the creation of the Leo. And yes, it was an electronic office. And that was the whole purpose of it. But the question I actually started out with was a silly one. Were any of the Leo people ever involved in this work? Yes. But I said 
about the Leo Society volunteers. Yes. In fact, I've seen Ken Kemp in the audience. Um, so I was the only non-Leo person involved in actually making... No, it's not quite true because the two guys who um, uh, dealt with the, uh, the Microsoft compiling were also um, not Leo people. But they, all the people keying in the, um, the source code were ex Leo people, except for me, I did some of it. Um, yeah. Chair, can I interrupt? It's Dave Graham Briscoe, but Frank is putting his hand up. He was one of the original Leo One activists. And the thing I remember was basically payroll, which um, took a clerical member of staff sort of a minute and a half or three minutes, I can't remember the numbers, to do each payroll calculation. And Leo One did it in about two seconds. Well, as I said, Frank is waiting to say something, but you're on mute, Frank. Frank, you're on mute. Frank, you're on mute. The microphone switch. Hey, thank you. Uh, all I want to ask a very simple question. Um, quite a lot of people, of course, worked with uh, the master machine, Cleo, and worked with the Leo system with its arithmetic rather than the mnemonic things. How long did it take them to get totally used to that and not regret having the facilities which David were talking about, which surprised them, uh, all this numerical stuff rather than uh, mnemonics and such like? Of course, with Cleo, mnemonics came in again. So, so people like Ken Kemp and uh, so on, how did they find that? Could they work with that? I was um, it's Roy Smith. Uh, I'll to answer that question. I mean, like the English language, there's many words in there and we don't use in everyday life. So you tend to, as a programmer, get used to a subset of the 150 odd um, numeric um, codes. And actually, you'd pick it up very, very quickly. And even David would be able to pick it up quickly without our labels and uh, with funny numbers instead of um, <laughs> words with actions. It's it amazing how quickly the human mind can get used to some very strange constructs, isn't it? Even mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Getting used to means is that the way you think the, the world is. That's the real world. <laughs> yeah, the human brain is a very flexible thing, I think, Frank, isn't it? I was talking to Ken Kemp uh, a week or so ago about this absence of labels and the way that uh, yeah. when you inserted an extra instruction, all the numbers changed and he was saying how that was quite a nuisance for one thing you might remember that statement such and such was some entry point but all of a sudden it's it's number changes uh, and so you forget uh, which statements do which jobs actually Dave, that's not quite true because um, when the numbers were changed, then any reference from any other part of the programs would actually pick up that change reference number automatically. So it was all kept in order and you didn't have to worry about it. Very clever. Yeah, but okay. if, if you... Before I finish, I, I, I just say thank you very much to David and also the Computer Conservation Society for putting this on. But I... I see my dinner's behind me, and I have to go and eat it now. So <laughs> forgive me, I will leave at this moment. Thank and you, Frank. Thank you again, everybody. Have a, good, have a good evening. For this most interesting meeting. Okay. Tim Lyons got his hand up. Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank Here you. Go, I've got a couple of questions, one about uh, mnemonics and the other about timing. Um, I worked on, it's interesting you should mention the um, Elliott machines because I, I worked on those and yes, with only 15, 16 instructions, it wasn't hard to remember what, uh, to know what each one did. Um, but with many more, I'm just wondering whether you ever considered, I appreciate that the objective was to get the software working as it was, but I wonder whether you ever considered making a symbolic um, intercode um, translator or output or input or something um, because that would then make it very much easier 
and you, you mentioned you didn't even try to understand the um, master routine. It would presumably make it very much easier to try and understand other pieces of code if you if you made a symbolic. Oh, um, Tim, Tim, this is why uh, the, the listing, the program that we all call modernize that post process the listings, put the names of the instructions over on the right hand side um, so that um, in effect I got the mnemonics well except they weren't mnemonics they were the full names of the instructions were added in um, automatically by uh, the program either our initial translator uh, where in fact there were hot links or by um, the post-processing program that we use to put um, hot links into the listings from the genuine software. As regards labels, um, no, uh, but many, many years ago, um, in about 1970, uh, we, uh, uh, an MSc student and I, um, designed a language for KDF9, which uh, had, was much more an assembly language. It's quite interesting that I discovered um, in the last year or two that internally in English Electric, they also had uh, a similar sort of language. Uh, I know that, I mean, perhaps it's not so convenient to have it. it I wonder whether it's harder to understand what's going on if the um, listing is not in a sort of more conventional sort of layout with the mnemonic and then the instructions and, and so on. Um, I mean, I know that when we were working on the um, Elliott 905, um, there was a, a symbolic uh, um, assembler there and we developed a, a listing routine for that, which made things much easier for more modern programmers. I don't know, you may be right, but one thing that did occur to me, we, um, I did I did try to understand the master routine, um, but when I got to a bit where it was modifying the code, um, <laughs> that, that, that's when um, I gave up trying to follow it. So, but yeah, it's interesting that I did draw a comparison between the amount of commentary in the Leo code and the amount of commentary in the KDF9 code. The KDF9 code is very lacking in commentary. KDF9 code from that era, uh, whereas the intercode has lots and lots of comments in it. And it could be because the language is somewhat impenetrable, the comments mm. become more important. Um, and it, it, in some curious ways, it might even be a good thing. I might say, uh, George 3 is all, has parts of George 3 are spectacularly lacking in comments. Um, uh, I remember one- I, I think there's a mistake when people seem to think that if they write the program, it'll be self-documenting. <laughs> Maybe by making the programming language totally obscure, it forces you to document it properly. <laughs> it looks like it, doesn't it? You know, you, I, I can imagine that the, the the writers, the software writers, may well have written on the paper sort of labels in English and then not been able to translate them later. David, David, would you like to turn your light on? Oh, yeah. Um, before we go any further, I know it's just yeah, I'm Mike, sure. Mike Davy has got his hand up, but... Uh, Brian Randall made a, an interesting comment in the chat. Brian, if you want to raise that one, that comment about KDF9, since we've been talking KDF9. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I just remember that uh, uh, there was a long uh, battle um, with all sorts of uh, uh, swings and roundabouts over the character code um, for the KDF9. Um uh, eventually uh, having the um, uh, all of the characters from the Algol 60 reference um, uh, language in there. 
uh, uh, something that the people who were coming at it from uh, Fortran and the like weren't interested in at all. And it was uh, uh, it was fun to watch that. <laughs> That's in the days of standards before we had yeah. full standards, wasn't it? Local yeah. standards. Yeah. Okay, Mike, Mike Davey, put your hand up. Sorry, I was just going to ask, the other oh, question I was going to ask was oh, about sorry, the yeah. emulations, whether you had a lot of problems with timing, because um, emulators seem to fall over mostly with timing issues. Um, now, Tim, that brings comes back to a point I made earlier, or I think I did. The emulator that I've written, um, both for KDF9 and for Leo, are designed not so much to reproduce the hardware, but to make it possible to run the software. And so I've made no attempt to make the instruction timing like the real instruction timing, um, but merely to make it possible to run the software. Um, certainly, there's had to be stuff to do with real-time clocks and things like that, but I've I've not attempted to get the real time. If you, uh, Bill Findlay's KDF9 emulator, on the other hand, um, is doing quite serious things in that direction. Uh, things like interrupts and things I'm imagining are prob problematical. <coughs> yes, they would be, but the, uh, the master routine doesn't multi-program. I mean, it's 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 been written, I think, to to run a single program. That there there was a quite uh, complex interrupt system. Yeah, the interrupt system um, is actually quite clever because it avoids generating some of the interrupts that KDF nine would generate by only. Um, flagging that an, the end of a transfer should cause an interrupt in the event that there had been an attempt to address the device while it was busy. If, if, you, test, if you tested a device and it was busy, that, then it would change to another program. Yeah, I said and then if you came... It, but, but when it did that, it would also flag the device so that when the transfer finished, then uh, there would be an interrupt which would allow the master routine to switch back to the uh, uh, program that initiated the transfer. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, we'll try again. Mike, Mike Davy has got his hand up virtually on the thing, and I, and I, and I gather uh, PGW, sorry, I don't know your name, you've been waving apparently. But can we have Mike, Mike Davy first? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I, what I, I just want to make some comments. I may be wrong, but um, I didn't uh, remember having problems with labels in Intercode because we are sure we wrote in sections and we actually could jump from one section forward to another. And um, the inter Intercode translator would allow for that. So it was, it was never an issue. That, that's one little thing. The other thing is you were talking about 10 pence and 11 pence and how awkward it was. Well, the system was commercial. It was designed to work with that. And we had a radix register where we could set for pounds, shillings and pence. And so the calculations were fairly straightforward. Um, well, was, it you, was it you who mentioned you could do uh, pounds and ounces as well? Somebody mentioned that in no, the chat. I didn't, I didn't mention that. But in theory, uh, you probably could with a radix register. Um, the other thing, a little thing that was mentioned was about multi-programming and protection of storage. Mm. On the Leo 3, the long words had a four-bit tag. So they did in actual fact protect memory, as I understand it, for multiple programs. It, that's, that's exactly right. I, I likened it to the IBM 360 storage protection keys. Yes. Do you, do you remember MFT, MVT um, on OS 360? No, I remember DOS and DOS VS. <laughs> anyway, the, the point is, 
there, there are two aspects to this multi-programming aspect. One is the memory protection, where you rightly say that you protected uh, one program from being corrupted by other programs with these uh, tags on the memory words. And in fact, it's much finer than on the IBM 360, which uh, had the storage protection key on a, a block of memory. 4K, I think. Sorry? I think it was 4K bytes, wasn't it? On yeah. 360, yes. Yeah, well, no, it was on every, every long word. Yeah, but the difference is that you've... Uh, the, the KDF9 and the 1900 have a, a datum register called base register on the KDF9 datum on the 1900, uh, which is added to every address. That means that any um, object program can be physically moved in memory um, and by resetting this base register, you can then continue executing it um, without any ill effects on the program whatsoever. Uh, now, of course, Atlas, on the other hand, and had um, the virtual address of each page attached to that page. So it, it was, um, in some ways, a bit like the uh, memory protection keys, so that when you addressed um, the memory, then the associative lookup would, would then come back and the page that corresponded to the address would then be the one that was accessed. Hmm. Um, nowadays, of course, we've got segment tables and page tables uh, and um, great mountains of um, address mapping. But um, the issue about multiprogramming in a real memory machine is, uh, I think, a very real one. And at the time, uh, must have seemed a major problem. Yes, okay. another little thing slightly associated with that. Um, the standard address form was 13 bits, which only went up to 8192 short words. We had a machine of multiple divisions. And my understanding is that the, um, it was either the interco translator or the loader actually inserted what they called interdivisional references, which is equivalent to your additional register that would allow you to uh, access another division. In fact, the programs were normally broken up into chapters and they could reside in different uh, different divisions of memory. Oh yeah, the, the different chapters uh, could be in quite different uh, parts of memory and scattered about and the loading process um, would put the correct addresses into the um, the instructions uh, and every memory address was relative to the current uh, wait a moment, I don't know that. a lot of the memory addresses took the top two bits of the program counter as part of the address but all of these addresses were actually relocated at load time so once the program was in memory it had to stay in the place where it had been loaded, mm -hmm. which makes memory management really rather difficult. Yes, no, I agree with that. But all I was pointing out is that they could reference um, a, a chapter in another division. So you did actually have programs that could be more than 8192 short words long. Oh, heck, yes. I mean, uh, sorry, the, in trying to sort of explain how we got it to work, uh, I obviously had to miss out and gloss over all sorts of truths such as that. Yes, also edit tables, which were quite interesting, which was a big part of um, the Interco translator, which allowed you to unpack and pack data onto magnetic tape blocks and also set up printout. Yeah, I remember the uh, uh, dismay with which I discovered this aspect of the order code because, of course, I then had to re-implement it in C. <laughs> okay, Mike, I think, okay, uh, right. just, yeah, just to, to move on because the time is moving on. Um, 
sorry, I don't know your name. It was a PGW, and you're waiting for ages personally to say, ask a question. Yes, sir. But good to identify myself. Peter Wharton, but uh, right. I haven't used this bit for ages, so it's out of date. I've got some comments and one question for David. Uh, I started on Intercode in 1962 and didn't know any better. So I never never felt any problem with not having mnemonics or whatever. I think it may have, may have affected my coding for the rest of my life, whatever. <laughs> uh, but I really thought the Leo machine was a, a, a good, a beautiful design. Uh, uh, going back to multiprogramming, uh, the, one of the things I was taught on, a, on my first course was you design program and you broke them up into three sections. First section read the paper tape, the middle section did the calculations, and the final section did the printing, and you passed data between each section using the, using the MAC tape, uh, which was the, the first program I did with the transportation, and, and, that, and that's why it worked. Um, the, 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 the other comment, which uh, may be completely wrong, I'm afraid, but my wife, who, who ran them, uh, ran the master program section for quite a bit of her career in, in, in when we're working for Leo. Uh, as far as she was concerned, they wrote Leo in 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 uh, not in an intercode, but wrote it in in, in the, the normal in the sort of the machine language. Uh, I'm not quite sure what she what they submitted it to, but she she regarded intercode as something she didn't understand. Uh, Could I, I answer that? Yeah. Um. I, I mentioned how intercode actions 100 through to 131 translate into directly into computer code. So if you write intercode using only those instructions, then in fact you are writing in computer code and in the, uh, the master routine is written in that style. Yes, yes, I, yes, I mean, but, but the way instruct. We have some of the later instructions. I remember when I wrote some, I did do some language, moved into some uh, language low down. You could do it through the intercode translator. I can't remember, what, I can't remember how, how much. Anyway, I have the question I have for you, David, which was, I don't know whether it's relevant. But did you get any information or any sort of from the, because the, there was the, the the formal project of Leo when at, at Dow Keith, which was in a, emulation of Leo on, on the 2900 machines. Well, I, I did mention that when I mentioned about the post office. Yeah. Uh, and, his, uh, and well, the GPO and the telephone billing. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, somebody else who worked on 2900 said they knew nothing about this. Um, I didn't realize it had been done at Donald Keith. But yeah, I, I remember, I went up to visit them. Yeah, I've, I've actually been there. Um, but I, all the, I mean, they were running the program for real for BT, as far as I remember. Uh, so they must have had a lot of the uh, sort of original, some of the stuff you might have had missing, like a Clio compiler. Oh, yeah. Um, if you know anybody who's got any old Leo Mag tapes, <laughs> or, or even a printout of the Clio compiler. Please yeah. let us know because, <clears throat> frankly, I think if we were able to get that, it would uh, just show the really good things about Leo. Uh, I think it's easy to criticise Intercode, but I've had a good look at the Clio manual and I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah. My education, the the the, the initialisation course you did when you started at Leo. This was in September '62. The first thing they taught you was Clio, yeah. And then in the second week they taught you intercode. I mean, there were two extremes. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. All I think a lot of people have uh, have gone, but there's still thirty odd of you left, which is which is encouraging. Uh, thank you, David. I'm I'm impressed with the amount of work you put into all this stuff. Well, there were well, others. I think. Yeah, fact, well, there's, there's others as well. You're you're fronting up, but you've done you've done others as well. So uh, looking through those spreadsheets and the people that, uh, that had to type those in, I, I couldn't I couldn't even begin to imagine the amount of work involved. Anyway, from all of us, thank you very much for the talk, David. Yes, thank you very much.
a, a, a virtual a virtual class <laughs> there. Um, I'm going to turn the recording off in a minute. One thing I forgot to say early on is to remind people or, or to mention that since the last one of these meetings we had, um, we've lost Gordon Adshead and Tom Hinchliffe, um, very, very sadly. Uh, maybe I should have started with a minute's uh, silence for them, but um, the, the time moves on, unfortunately, and uh, it's very sad to see both of them go, Alan and I. Really had um, rather a lot to uh, to follow up when we took over from those two, so I'm very 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 excited about both of them going. Um, as I said, we've got another talk coming up in a couple of months' time about Janet. I hope to see quite a few of you again for that. It'll certainly teach me something I don't know about. And until then, uh, thank you all for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And hope you don't get blown away. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>